Hallelujah. That's how we change the atmosphere. Glory to God. They taught us a long time ago, anytime you want God in the room, you praise him when you want him in the room. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. So anytime I need God to show up at home, at work, at school, wherever I am, sometimes I'm in my car, I got to pull over and clap and shout because God has been good to me. Hallelujah. Has he been good to anybody in the room? Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say he's been real good. Hallelujah. I want to welcome all of you into the presence of God. Not only do we want to welcome you into the presence of God, but we're getting ready to go to the word of God. We worship him so that he can know that we're honoring him and we're getting him in the room. But we honor him by speaking his word so that we can leave here better than we came. When we preach and teach the word of God, it's so that whatever happens throughout the week, we have something that we can fight the enemy with. Sometimes you can't fight the enemy with a praise. You see, praise is for God. You fight the enemy with the word of God. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. It gives us direction. So when we go to the word of God today, we want to remember not only do we hear the word of God while we're in the service, but we take notes, we go home, we study the word of God throughout the week, we get online for our refuel Bible study. Minister Sandy Clarmy does a wonderful job sharing the word of God with us on Wednesday nights. Come on, clap your hands and let's give God praise for the woman of God. And we do all of these things so that you can have tools by which you can fight the enemy. Because the enemy does not fight fair. He does not fight fair. He's on his job 24-7. So we need to have tools from the word of God so that we can fight back. Somebody say fight back. Today our tools are coming from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It's so good to see so many of you in the room. It feels good. As Minister Sandy said, it feels good in the building. Hallelujah. There's several of you. Um, I was online uh, this week, and they said, some, I saw a meme, or I saw something that said, something about June is every day in June, at least five people have a birthday. It's something about June. That's what it said. I don't know if it's true or not, but something about June, at least three to five people have a birthday every day. And I know that to be true because I can at least point out three people that had a birthday this week. And they're all on the front row. Elder Tyra Anderson had a birthday yesterday. Minister Taylor Perry had a birthday on Monday. Elder Kimber Dennis had a birthday on Tuesday or Wednesday. On Wednesday. Who else had a birthday this week? Did anybody else have a birthday this week? All right, so the three of them had a birthday this week. Give me a good key. We're going to sing happy birthday to them. All right? One, two. Y'all hear that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Elder Tyra Taylor. Elder Kimbra. Happy birthday to you. May God bless you. May God bless you. Yes. May God bless you. Make parts. May God bless you. Come on and wish him a happy birthday. God bless you happy birthday hallelujah second chronicles chapter 7 I feel like preaching the word of God this morning second chronicles chapter 7 we're looking at verses 1 through 11 we're going to be reading from the new king james version second chronicles chapter 7 
when you have the word of God, I want you to signify by simply saying, yeah, uh uh-huh. We have some first timers here today. Thank you for coming and worshiping God with us. And then we see some of you that we have not seen in a long time. It's so good to see you all today. It's good to see everybody. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1 begins. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls. Wow. 120,000 sheep. Wow. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests attended to their services. The Levites also with instruments of the music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, For his mercy endures forever. When David offered praises by their ministry, the priests sounded trumpets opposite them while all Israel stood. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we stand when we honor God. We stand to reverence him because together we are honoring God just like they did right here in the biblical text. Verse 7. Furthermore, Solomon consecrated the middle of the court. He consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat. Imagine the smell. Imagine. The Bible says that they offered burnt offerings, peace offerings, fat offerings, grain offerings. The offerings in biblical times was not green. It was not money. So for seven days, they offered animals, dead animals. For seven days, in the middle of the altar, they offered this. For seven days, can you imagine? I'm trying to paint a picture because I don't want us to just read the Bible and read over what's going on. The reason I want you to pay attention to that is because they did this for seven days Then there was people that were a part of the congregation who came and cleaned up all of the offerings before they moved to the next verse. Watch what happens after verse 7. Verse 8 says this. At that time, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him. A very great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt, verse 9. And on the eighth day, somebody shout the eighth day. On the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly, for they observed and dedicate they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and feast seven days. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their tents, joyful and glad of heart. For the good that the Lord had done for King David and for King Solomon and for his people Israel. In other words, they didn't leave the same way they came. They came to the house of God one way, but they left glad and full of joy for what the Lord had done for not only the king, but for what he he had done for all of the people. Final verse. Thus Solomon finish the house of the Lord and he finished the king's house and Solomon successfully 
accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Today I want to teach from the thought or the theme, glory clouds are forming. Can you look at somebody on your row and say glory clouds are forming? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this priceless privilege we have to be in your presence. Your word declares in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We thank you for this particular text, for how you showed us how King Solomon prayed when he had finished praying, how you, you came down with fire, approval your presence came down and filled the temple with glory so much so that the priest couldn't even stand in the temple to preach or minister because your glory had filled the house you're teaching us how to build a temple for you you're teaching us how we are to pay attention to everything we do as we are building the temple you're teaching us how to teach the word of God so much so that when we leave, we'll be better as a result of our coming. We don't want to just come to church, God, and leave the same way we came. But we want to leave full of joy, full of gladness, because what happened while we were here. I believe the presence of the Lord was here today. And as a result, somebody's going to be healed, somebody's going to be delivered, and somebody's going to be set free. Now that we have felt the presence of God move, we pray that you would speak a word to us, a word that would edify us, a word that would build us up in our most holy faith. It is our sincere prayer, O oh God, that the heavens would drop, that the skies would pour out righteousness, and that the earth would bring forth salvation. Thank you for everybody that's here today. Let not our coming be in vain, but God, let us leave better than we came. We want to leave full of joy and gladness, just like the people in the Bible. Say a word and we shall never be the same. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. The glory clouds are forming. Somebody say the glory clouds are forming. I'm sure many of you have heard the news or heard on the news about the fires that are happening in Canada that is creating such a fog and it's happening. The fire is happening in Canada, but the fog is being created in other places. The fog is in New York, and even the fog has gone to the places such as Massachusetts. Touch certain places as Massachusetts. Can you all do me a favor? Um, I forgot to make this announcement. While we're ministering, ladies, I'm sorry. You can't use this bathroom while we're ministering. There's things going on over here that while we're ministering, you can't use that bathroom. I'm sorry. You got to hold it while we're ministering, okay? I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you that, right? But many of us heard that this week. Something's going on in one place, but production is happening in another. God's glory is showing up in a place because people did something in the place where God's glory is showing up. The Bible says right here that when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. The glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I want to say something to somebody in here today. If God does not show up, I don't want to come to church. If God does not meet us when we come here, if his presence doesn't meet us, if his power doesn't meet us, if his spirit doesn't meet us, there's no need in us coming. 
It's good to see one another. It's good for us to give each other a high five. It's good for us when we do our welcome. Don't you want to go where everybody knows your name? It's good for us to greet one another and hug one another. But if God does not show up, then our coming has been in vain. So I want to teach us how to get God in the room. The Bible says he shows up two ways. He shows up when we talk to him, when we pray, but mainly he shows up when we talk to him in praise. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. What that simply means, my brothers and my sisters, is that he lives, he dwells, or he resides in our praise. Somebody repeat after me. Say, God inhabits the praises of his people. Say it again. God inhabits the praises of his people. What that simply means is that he lives, he dwells, or he resides in our praise. What that really means or what the word of God is saying to me is that I don't have to necessarily wait till I get to this building before I get in the presence of God. Because when I get in this building, I'm, I'm, I'm believing that the presence of God is already here. But I don't have to wait till I get here to get into the presence of God. I can praise God in my car because God inhabits the praises of his people. And if I praise him in my car, I believe his presence will be in my car with me. I can praise him in my home, and because his presence inhabits the praises of his people, I believe his presence will be in my home with me. This is why you hear me say from time to time, you don't have to wait till you come to church to have church because we are the church. Can you say that with me? Say, you don't have to wait to come to church to have church. Because we are the church. Think about it. Don't wait till you get here and the praise leader has to pump and prime you before you open your mouth and give God praise. But the Bible says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth until all generations. Let me say this again. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and enter into his courts with praise. That suggests to me is that if I'm going to enter the doors with thanksgiving, if I'm going to enter the doors with praise, then I must have been outside Enter, I must have been outside with thanksgiving. I must have been outside with praise. I was outside saying, God, thank you for letting me get here. Thank you for not letting me get into an accident. Thank you for letting me see another day. Thank you for the activities of my limbs. Thank you for the breath that you have given me to breathe in my body. And I remember what the word of God said in Psalm 150. Let everything that have breath Praise ye the Lord. If I'm going to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise, that suggests that I am on the outside with thanksgiving and praise. This is why I want us to learn how to praise God at home, how to praise God and pray to God when we're not in the building. So when we get in the building, it's not so hard to get a praise out of people. It's actually easy to get a praise out of you because you realize I owe him a praise. If I don't do anything else when I get here today, if I don't give any money, I'm going to open my mouth and give God praise. If I don't give nobody a high five, I'm going to clap my hands and give God praise because I came here to open my mouth and to glorify him. I came here. The Bible says in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall 
continue to be where? In my mouth. Let's say it again. His praise is in my mouth. Not your praise, not my praise, but his praise is in my mouth. That means I have to give God something that belongs to him while I'm here because I can't leave here without giving him what belongs to him. I don't know about or who I'm talking to, but if you didn't give it to him before you got here or if you didn't give it to him before you leave, don't leave this place without giving God what belongs to him. Solomon in the text is teaching us how to build the house of God. He's teaching us what it takes to build the house of God. As I was telling you what was happening in Canada, I was especially concerned about what was happening in Canada because my daughter Taylor took a trip, about a two or three day trip. It was her birthday. She said, I don't need, this is what I love about my daughter. I don't need anybody to take me anywhere or go with me anywhere. If I feel like going somewhere, I'm going to get up and enjoy life for myself. That sounds a little bit like your father. I ain't going to wait for nobody else, but I'm going to go and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to enjoy life. I'm going to see the world for myself. Can I tell somebody that there is more to life than what you have seen? There's more to life than your neighborhood. There's more to life than the people that are around you. There's more to life than the people in your family. Some people don't want you to enjoy life because they can't enjoy life. But don't try to hold me back just because God has not blessed you because you refuse to praise him. You refuse to obey him. You refuse to sow a seed. But if God has blessed my life and he has favored me, then I'm going to take the favor of God with me wherever I go. And I'm going to see, oh shoot, God lives in Canada too. Oh shoot, God lives in Africa too. Oh shoot, God is everywhere at the same time. The word of God says, I feel like preaching, that he is omnipresent, which means he's the same God in Boston, the same God in Canada, the same God in Africa, the same God in Asia. He is omnipresent God. He is everywhere at the same time. Somebody shout same time. I was concerned about what was going on in Canada because something or somebody I loved was there. So I asked, I asked Taylor, I said, Taylor, was it orange in Canada like it was in New York? She said, no, Daddy. She said, as a matter of fact, I didn't even smell anything that smelled like fire or smoke. Maybe the first day I smelled it and then the rest of the days I was there, I didn't smell it. I told her, I said, maybe your nose or your body got used to the smell and didn't know what it was smelling like. What I'm trying to get you to understand, don't believe everything people are telling you on the news because they'll make you scared that the world is coming to an end. I, it's something going on in New York. I don't know what it is, but I'm staying away from it. That's just something else I'm going to say to you. Y'all can still go shop in New York. Just don't stay there, okay? Just don't stay there. There's something going on in New York. Oh, some, uh, some of y'all from New York? I'm sorry. Anybody in here from New York? All right. There's something going on in New York. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but the, the, when, when I looked on the news and I saw that it was orange, I watched ESPN. Anybody else in here watch ESPN First Take? You watch it with Stephen A. Smith and all them. Well, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm looking, watching first take, and I'm looking outside, and they usually have this beautiful landscape, and the water is usually beautiful, and I see this orange smog or fog, and I'm wondering what in the world is going on. So I turn over to CNN, and they're telling me that what's going on in Canada is found its way all the way over in New York, and it is making a difference in New York. What's happening in Canada? And so when Taylor came home, I said, Taylor, what was going on in Canada? She said, the only time I smelled it, Daddy, was the first day I was there. Don't y'all believe or get scared 
based on what you see in the news. As a matter of fact, y'all, y'all, y'all got to get on your knees. We all have to get on our knees and pray because we don't know what's happening until God tells us what's happening. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's things that goes on in the world right now. And I'm like, what in the world is that? I've seen things on the news that I've never seen before, that I've never heard before. Things are happening in the world, and actually it's preparing us for the last days. The Bible says before that, before Jesus comes again, some things will happen, and they will happen before he comes back. So as we start seeing things line up, We have to get our lives in order so that we are ready. Somebody shout ready. So that we are ready when Jesus comes. Ladies, if you need to use the bathroom, the bathroom is open again. All right, God bless you. Let's go back to the word of God. What is happening in our text? We see that Solomon, somebody shout Solomon. Solomon had made an end of praying and the fire of God consumed what was on the altar. Can somebody say after me, say fire doesn't fall on empty altars. If you want God to show up wherever you are, you got to put something on the altar of your life. There needs to be something on the altar of your heart in order for the presence of God to meet you. I want to make sure that God is pleased with my life. I want to make sure that God is pleased with my service. I want to make sure that God is pleased with how I treat people. There needs to be something on the altar of your life. The Bible says when Solomon had made an end of praying, fire came down and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices that were already on the altar. Which leads me to believe that if there was not Jatira, anything on the altar, then there would not have been anything for the fire of God to consume. You got to make sure there's something on the altar of your heart. So when the approval of God shows up, there's something for God to consume that that consumption creates glory. Glory to God. There's a consumption happening that God is meeting what is in your heart. And glory is going to follow you wherever you go. I understand that as the body of Christ, we need to be infected and affected by the glory of God that's being released in this season. I believe the glory of God is being released all over the world. And if you're connected, you'll be affected by it. If you're disconnected, you won't feel anything. God is doing something new. Somebody shout new. The word of God says, I will do a new thing. Can you not perceive it? Don't you see it? Don't you know it? God is doing something new, kingdom. I need you to understand, even in the midst of us, God is trying to do something new. And some of us, unfortunately, want to stay where we've been. But God's God got something for us that is better than he had for where you were. Paul said it like this, forgetting what's behind you and reaching forward to what's in front of you. Somebody shout press. I press toward the goal or the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The glory of God is being released all around the world. And if we are connected will be affected. But if we're disconnected, we won't know what's going on. That's why some of us don't feel nothing. That's why some of us can't recognize what God is doing. That's why God is trying to do something new, and we're frustrated and frustrated and frustrated. The reason why many of us are frustrated, can I help you to understand something? We're frustrated because God has put us in a new place, but we're still connected to old relationships. And those old relationships won't allow you to be great. 
They won't allow you to be great. You're saying something new. You're talking new. You're looking new. You're saying something different. And people just want to stay the way they've been because most people are comfortable with the same old humdrum way of living. Most people don't like change. But in your life, if you're going to be a part of the body of Christ, God changes. And when God changes, I can't remember who sang a song, but they said, when you move, I move. Just like that. God moves. And when God moves, I want to move with God. I want to go with God. I want to stay with God. Whatever God is doing in this season, whatever you're doing in this season, Lord, don't do it without me. Don't say it without me. Don't run it without me. Make sure I'm connected so that when you do something new, I'm new too. In our text, King Solomon is currently building the house of the Lord and simultaneously he's building himself a house as well. This is good. Because when I was reading this text this week, we're right in the middle of building God a house. Haven't you been blessed coming to minister or coming to serve or worship every week? And every time you come in here, you see something brand new. Uh, Come on, you can clap your hands. Don't act like that. Don't act like that. Give God praise for brand new. Sometimes some of us can't appreciate it because we ain't a part of it. Yeah, there's other people that's here every day working, trying to do this, trying to do that, so that when we come here on Sunday, there's something here for you to be blessed by. Can I get you? Can I get you to get a become a part or join in? Do get involved with what God is doing. God is doing something new, and I guarantee you, you'll appreciate it when you become a part of it. I don't know what you can do. Maybe you can get on media. Maybe you can get on worshiping arts. Maybe you can help clean up. Man, I don't know what you can do, but you can do more than just show up on Sunday. Ask your neighbor, what can you do? There's so much that needs to be done. The reason why I stopped and told you all, the reason why I stopped and told you all that they uh, had the sacrifices for seven days and I explained what was really going on is because I wanted you to understand that there couldn't have just been a few people taking care of everything in the temple. It couldn't have been just a few people taking care of everything in the temple. There has to be a, if, if there's going to be a great house, there's going to have to be great service. The the Bible says in every great house, there are vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor. And what that simply means, in, in every great house, there'll be people serving and there'll be people watching. In every great house, let the, let the, the Bible says that God will do the separating, let The wheat and the tare grow together, and when God shows up, he is going to do the separating. What are you trying to say? We're in the middle of building God a house, and every week I celebrate when I walk in here and I see something new. I can point to what's brand new. Some of you all uh, aren't really paying attention, but you, you were in here for three weeks without a floor. You were in here, well, one one week you was in here with a terrible looking floor. And we weren't ready for worship. But the reason why we wanted you to see it is because we wanted you to be a part of building God a house. We wanted you, something in you to spark. For you can say, what can I do? There's something, there's a gap over here. 
what can I do to fill it? I can, you know what? I, I never knew the church needed somebody to paint. I'm the best painter up in here. Now, I'm not really. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm not really. I'm saying one of you all can be saying, you know what? I never knew that going to the house of God, I can give God worship with my paintbrush. I'm the best painter up in here. I'm not, but one of you might be. Y'all can give God worship by cleaning up. Somebody in here is one of the best cleaners in here. Now, I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you can't clean better than me. I, I bet you. Let's, let's, I, let's put some money on it. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir, Jonathan. We don't bet. Right? But I guarantee you, you can't clean better than me. I'm going to tell you why I know that. Because I had a hard taskmaster. I grew up under a hard taskmaster. <laughs> Pharaoh. <laughs> I had a hard taskmaster that would drive us every day. I'm telling you, we had to clean. We had chores. How many of y'all young people have chores in this season? Young people, I'm talking to y'all. Y'all got chores? Good. Good. Yeah, I'm glad to see. Good. Good. Young people, got chores? Come on. Wonderful. Yeah. The ones, the hands that I haven't seen go up, fine. Parents, give them something to do. Give them something to do because they can't appreciate what they don't participate in. I help you to understand that. I, I go in my daughter's rooms. I'm telling you, and I'm like, listen. This ain't your house. This is my house. This is my room. I don't care if you sleep in it. Now, I don't want you to leave my room looking like this. Right? Oh, some of y'all ain't going to say nothing because your house is a mess. Yeah. No, no. Uh-uh, you come, you come here, if you, live up, if you live up under this roof, there's a certain way that certain things need to be. What are you trying to say, Bishop? Get back to your sermon. I'm on my sermon. You have to understand that in God's house, we may come here, but we don't live here. This is his house, and in his house, certain things need to be a certain way. We can't just throw things at God's house and say, here. This is the one thing that I told God when he called me to the ministry. I said, God, I'm sure these people don't want me to be their pastor because the first thing I'm going to do is it will not be acceptable most of the stuff that I grew up in and I used to come to church. I used to come to church and see certain things that I said, Ma, I used to get in trouble all the time. Ma, why is God so rich and God so great but this church looks so bad? Why does it smell like that in here? Why does it smell like mildew? You ever go to a church, smell like chicken and mildew? Y'all know I'm telling the truth. We can't just offer God anything and just throw it at him and just say, here, no. We have to offer God our best. Why? Because what we offer him is indicative of our, how we value him, how we value our relationship with him. If you don't value your relationship, then you'll just come in here and you'll be satisfied with anything. I'm not mad when you say, Bishop, you're doing too much. You don't got to be all that. You don't got to do all that. Yes, I do, because God has done all that and more for me. You don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. You can't tell it. Let me tell it what the Lord has done for me. And I don't only tell you what he's done out of my mouth, but what I'm a part of. What I put my hands to, what I put my name on, I'm showing you the value of my relationship with our God. 
That's why when you, you ought to clap your hands and give God praise that you have ministry leaders in this house that have a relationship with God, that have a spirit of excellence, that we say we love God enough that we want to give God our best. Clap your hands and say thank you, Jesus. King Solomon spared no expense. I'm, I'm, I was all over the place. King Solomon spared no expense when it came to building God a house. I believe this spoke to his value or the value he placed on his relationship with God. Value, my brothers and my sisters, is the regard that, we, that something is held to um, or deserve, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. He was building something new for God, and he understood the future scriptural message that says you cannot put new wine in old wine skins. Let me talk to kingdom builders for a minute. Some of us want to do the same things the same way, but we can't do the same things the same way in a new house. You can't put new wine in old wine skins. What will happen? The Bible says it will expand and it will burst and it will waste. What will happen is God is trying to do something new and it's just going to waste out because we're trying to put new wine in old wine skins. We're trying to do something new with old protocols. It doesn't even make sense. And the truth is, watch this. I realize something, including me. I'm not just talking about y'all. I'm a part of Kingdom Builders too. I'm talking about myself too. It's crazy that we are in a new location and some of us will sit in the same spots. Look around. Look around. I'm not playing. Look around. In a new place, but we're sitting in the same places that we used to sit at in 234. It's a mental thing. And what God is trying to get us to do is to just break old molds for no reason at all. Just so that your spirit can, un can catch up with your body. So your spirit can say, you know what? I'm not going to be the same person I used to be. I'm not going to talk the same way. I'm not going to act the same way. I'm not going to serve the same way. I'm not going to preach the same way. I'm not going to sing the same way. I'm not going to do the same things I did before. Sometimes I'm just going to change things up just for the sake of changing it up. Because God is doing something new. And if God is doing something new and we say God lives on the inside of us, then God has to do something new through you. He has to do something new through us. It doesn't make much sense to me, but if you pay attention to what's happening even in your own house. Uh, my therapist told me, I told you all this before, but my therapist told me that anybody that changes up something all the time, you're not really satisfied with something. If you're always changing your room up, there's something in you that's you're not satisfied with something. And I didn't realize that until they said it to me, and I was like, wow. That is so true. I change certain things up all the time. They, I get bored with stuff all the time. I'll change something up just for the sake of changing it up. I'll walk in my house and say, you know what? That's been sitting there for two weeks. And it ain't nothing wrong with it being there for two weeks. But let me just move it over here for a second. See how that makes me feel. Let me sit down and see how that makes me feel. Nah, I don't like it. Let me put it back. 
Some of us have to do things different just for the sake of doing things different to see how it makes us feel. What am I trying to say? Solomon built God a house and he was teaching the people how to serve different, how to worship different, how to do things different because God was getting ready to do something new in the midst of his people. And everybody was blessed because they followed the leader. The Bible said in one of these verses, the Bible says that the king started giving a burnt offering. What did I tell y'all? He said he gave, and it sounded like it was a lot. I don't go back to it. Sound like it was a lot. He says, what was it? King, here it is, verse 5. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls. Like 22,000 bulls. Can you imagine? Act like King Solomon is here. 22,000 bulls are on its way up Columbia Road so that it can be offered in the middle of the temple. 22,000 bulls, but not only that, Elder, he also brought 120,000 sheep to offer as a sacrifice in the middle of the temple for seven days, the Bible says. Seven days, all you saw. All you saw was bull and sheep. <laughs> right? For seven days. And I, I could only imagine that at least for two of those days, they had to clean up. Because on the eighth day, the Bible says that King Solomon called for a sacred assembly. He called for a sacred assembly so that we don't give God worship or service in the midst of a bunch of mess. Y'all will catch it when you get home. At least two of those days they had to clean up because we can't give God worship in mess. So he called for a sacred assembly, and he said, I want us, y'all know what a sacred assembly is? We're going to consecrate ourselves. We ain't going to eat what we used to eat. We ain't going to say what we used to say. We ain't going to watch what we used to watch. We're not going to drink what we used to drink. We're not going to go where we used to go. It is a sacred assembly, and everybody has to do it. We are preparing ourselves to consecrate ourselves to be used in a holy way by a holy God. Right? That's what he called for. It was uh, uh, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. That's what the king gave. Then the Bible says all the children of Israel followed what the king did. Maybe they didn't have 22,000 bulls or 120,000 sheep, but they had what they had, and they brought what they brought. Ladies and gentlemen, can I help you to understand that God, his fire or his approval will never fall on an empty altar. You got to bring something to God for yourself. You cannot live off of your pastor's sacrifice. You cannot live off of your mother's prayers. You cannot live off of your father's prayers. You cannot live off of your praise partner's praise. But when you become a certain age, you're going to have to learn to give God a sacrifice for yourself. At some point, Taylor had to learn how to give God a sacrifice for herself. I don't know when it happened. I know when it happened for me. When I moved out of my mother's house and my mother wanted me to come back home, but 
I didn't go back home because what I was doing where I was at, I knew I couldn't do in my mother's house, and I liked doing what I was doing, and I can't do that in her house, so I'm going to stay where I'm at. And while I was in my own house, and I couldn't afford, when something went off, I couldn't go home just because I couldn't afford the heat. Y'all won't believe this. I don't do it no more, thank God, because I'm blessed. But I used to heat my house with the stove. Do y'all know how dangerous that was? I'm a, a small, I'm talking about a two-bedroom apartment, a little old living room. I called it a dining room, but it was just a little room off the kitchen. I pulled that stove open, turned it up. I, I called it the stove. It's really the oven. The whole thing is the stove. We heat. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Used to heat the, used to heat the crib with the, with the oven, and then turn it off when I brought my friends over. And they're like, man, <coughs> it's dry in here. <coughs> I'm like, man, don't worry about it. Just get something to drink. You'll be fine. Do I have a witness any bit, anywhere in the building? What are you saying? There's things that we had to learn for ourselves. And at some point, you're going to have to learn that mama's sacrifice is not going to be enough for your service to God. Daddy's sacrifice is not going to be enough for my relationship with God. I learned when I was on my own. Thank God for what my mother taught me. Thank God for what my father taught me. Thank God for what King Solomon is showing the people of Israel so that they'll know how to worship God the right way. They'll know how to build a house the right way. They'll know how. Building a house for God is really just indicative of building a relationship with him. What you do in his house is indicative of what you do in your relationship with him. This is why we don't sin in his house. We don't have a problem with sin usually when we're in church. Usually we don't have a problem with sin when you're here. We don't need to pray, God, deliver me from fornication while we're here. No, no. We need to pray that prayer when we're at your house. Because we don't usually have a problem with fornication in the Lord's house. We have a problem with fornication in our houses. So, so how can that help us? Do what you do in the Lord's house in your house. If you do what you do in the Lord's house in your house, then God will be there. And the word says that God does not dwell. Y'all got to read your Bible. He don't dwell in unclean temples. That's why you can't tell me that God is at everybody's house. You can't tell me that God is living in everybody because the Bible says that God does not dwell in an unclean temple. The Bible says, who, thank you, I feel the Holy Ghost, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He that have clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands is how you deal with people and a pure heart is your relationship toward God. I know I'm preaching in here today. <laughs> King Solomon is building a house so he can teach us how to build our relationship daily with God. You must offer prayer and sacrifice. Somebody said prayer. prayer. Say sacrifice. Your sacrifice is a sacrificial offering, what you give to the Lord, and sacrifice is something that you really don't want to give, but you give it because he deserves it. That's a sacrifice. A sacrifice is not something you just give freely and you don't feel it. Let me put it in, in numeric terms. $5 for most of us is not a sacrifice. Some of us, $5 is a sacrifice. 
in numeric terms, some of us are not going to feel $5. So when we give that to God, there's no favor coming back on that offering because it wasn't a sacrifice. Now, if $5, this is why God doesn't bless us according to to what I give versus what you give versus what you give versus what you give. That's why we don't play that game in church. People need to stop playing this funny, you know, number line in church because that's not how God blesses you. Because 100 may be a sacrifice for me. 10 may be a sacrifice for you. I'm not getting a better blessing because I gave 100 and you getting a lesser blessing because you gave 10. No, it's a matter of sacrifice. And if 10 was a sacrifice for you and 100 was a sacrifice for me, we're getting the same blessing. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. You ain't going to hear many people, preachers or pastors, tell you that. But I'm trying to help you to understand that whatever is a sacrifice for you, that's what the blessing is coming back for. We need to give what sometimes we can't afford to give. Like, God, I need you to do something for me. And we say, you know what? I have this in my pocket, but I really can't afford to give it. I've been in places, Elder, where I've said, I have this in my pocket, and I can't afford not to give it. Because I need God to do something for me, and what I got in my pocket ain't going to do it anyway. So God, here it is. Take all of it, and let me see what you can do with it. And I've given everything I've gotten to the Lord, and I've watched God turn situations around. Kingdom, we got to stop acting like we have not watched God work a miracle on our behalf. What God did for us, nobody could have done it but God. We got to come here on Sundays and give God the best we have, the best praise, the best thank you, Jesus, the best hallelujah, the best financial offering that you have because what he did for us, nobody could have done it but God. Somebody shout, but God. I need you to understand that how you deal with God is indicative of how we value our relationship with him. His word says, I said this to you earlier, I'm almost done. I know I've been up here for a long time, but it feels good to me. Behold, I will do a new thing. Do you not know it? Can you not perceive it? God wants to do something new in us, and some of us are refusing to accept it. And what's worse, what's sad for many of us, is that we don't even know it. We can't even recognize that God is trying to do something new. Paul said it like this. I said it to you earlier. We have to forget what's behind us. I know where we've been, even if it's, you know, I used to hear this text in the church. And when the, when the preacher would say, forgetting what's behind you and reaching forward to what's in front of you, you got to press toward the mark. I used to think that the preacher was only talking about negative stuff. Like, forget that negative stuff that's behind you. Guess what, kingdom? You got to forget the phenomenal stuff that was behind you, too. You, that, that wonderful stuff that was behind you. God wants to do something greater than that. God wants to do something more than that. And if all we do is hold on to the glory years, then God can't do nothing more than what he has already done. But if we forget what's behind us, the good, the bad, the ugly, the excellent, and reach out to what's in front of us, we got to press. Somebody shout press. We have to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The Bible says this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It says that the temple was lavishly furnished 
the king understood the importance of building the house of the Lord and how it should look. The Bible says at the end in verse 11, the Bible says that he was successful in completing everything that was in his heart that he saw to build for God. We have to have something in our heart that we want to give to God. Something that's just, you know, um, this might be good enough for me, but this ain't good enough for God. This might be good enough for you, but this ain't good enough for God. God's relationship with us is so awesome that we can't be satisfied with the mundane things that we do for ourselves every day. We have to give God greater. Somebody shout greater. We have to do what it is that God is requiring of us. Of course, it's important for us to use the best of the best as it relates to offering anything for God. Because he used the best. Minister Sandy told us earlier that he gave us his best. He gave us his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But when I heard her say God gave us the best, y'all know I usually hear words and go with acronyms. God gave us his best, beautiful God, exquisite God, strong God triumphant God, best. Somebody shout best. He gave us all of these things, but what good is having a wonderful looking house for the Lord if he doesn't live there? What's good in us doing all this wonderful looking stuff, but we don't pray? So we come to a good looking space, but we don't do the things that get God in the house. You can come here on Sunday and feel good about what you've done Monday through Saturday, but if we won't do the spiritual things, somebody say the spiritual things, consecrate ourselves, pray, fasting, serving, outreach. In reach, doing the things that God requires of us. What good is us having a beautiful looking house if God doesn't live in the house? There's things that uh, if you came to my house, there should be something in my house that you see that might remind you or that might say, this is Bishop's house. You might see maybe these sneakers I got on today. When you walk in my house, maybe they might be sitting at the front door because we don't walk in our house with shoes on our feet. So you can see something that's in my house that belongs to me. Or maybe, Sister Nadesh, that wonderful oil that, you know, you blessed me with on last week. You might see that in my house. I live there. What belongs to me should be in my house. If God lives here, if this is his house, there should be things in this house that remind us that looks like God. You can't call it the house of God just because it got a cross on the top. Just because you got a cross on the top. No, it's not about the physical things we put in the house. It's the spiritual things. Kingdom, we got to get back on our knees. We got to get back to praying and fasting. We got to get back to reading our word. We got to get back to loving our neighbor as ourselves. Because Why? Why do we have to get back to that? Because that looks like God. When I see y'all loving on one another, yeah, that's the house of God. Because God would do that. Yep, God is love. When I see sacrifice, I see God. Because God would do that. He sacrificed his best. What good? What am I trying to say? 
Solomon did all of this wonderful stuff, but the approval of God would have never been there if the spiritual things were not in the house. Somebody say, we got to get back to God. They created an atmosphere for God to show up. They wanted God to dwell in the temple. God inhabits the praises of his people. How do we get God to enter a place, let alone dwell there? It's easier to get God to show up somewhere than it is to get God to stay where he showed up. Mm -hmm. Y'all know, y'all have invited certain people to your house. It's easier to get people to show up than it is to get people to stay. Uh, my other daughter, she's not feeling well, pray for her, but she, had a, uh, she went over her friend's house the other night, and funny story, she didn't really want to go, but, you know, she's a good friend, so she showed up over her friend's house, and she had been over there already for maybe about three or four hours, and this particular friend, when it was time for Cameron to come home, she started getting upset, and she wanted her to stay, and I said, how long she wants you to stay over there? And I said, Cameron, I said, I'm on my way right now, right? And so Cameron had said that she would take something home when she left. And Cameron didn't take something home when she left. And that same friend got upset that Cameron didn't take what she said she would take home when she left. What are you trying to say, Bishop? I'm trying to say it's easier to get somebody to show up than it is to get them to stay. You can just give me an invitation, I'll show up. But based on what's going on over there is what will, there you go, is what will make me stay or not or how long I'm going to stay. How comfortable I am while I'm there. Maybe that's why God don't stay around some of us too long. Because he's uncomfortable. Oh, my goodness. Maybe that's why God, you know, we, we're wondering, you know, where did God go? He was here. He just showed up. Yep, and he swept through there. And he was like, ooh, I can't stay there. It's easy to get him to show up. But it's hard to get them to stay. You can get them to show up with a praise. But you got to get them to stay with a sacrifice. I hope you heard what I just said. You can get them to show up with a praise. You, you can get them to show up with an invitation. Y'all know what invocation is? What, what we do at the beginning of service it's, it's the first prayer that we pray. It's the first exhortation when the ministers come up here. We're inviting God in. It's easy to invite him to show up. It's hard to get him to stay. Why? Because one person can invite him, but everybody got to keep him here. He ain't staying off of one person's invocation. He's not staying off of one person's invitation. He will come because she asked him, because she has a relationship with him. But he'll stay because while Taylor's leading us in worship, we're not just watching her and being entertained, but we're joining in and we're all keeping God in the building. Nope, he ain't gonna leave because he didn't get what I didn't get what I needed from him yet. We gotta have such a spirit of discernment. Our discernment has to be so turned up that we know when God is here and we know when he's ready to leave. And when he's ready to leave, I need somebody to have an unction to say, no, God, you can't leave yet because Bishop didn't get his breakthrough. You can't leave yet. Derek didn't get what he came here for. You can't leave yet. Elder didn't get what she came here for. God, you can't leave yet. And we do our part 
keeping God in the house corporately. Individually, I can get them here, but corporately, we got to make them stay. I'm going to have to give y'all the rest of this a little bit later because I got a whole lot more, but not much time. Watch what happens. Individuals that have relationships with God and we live with God, he walks with us, he talks with us. Y'all know that song we used to sing? And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Come on, let me see how much you know. And the, as we, none other. Oh, come on. Yeah, we got to get back to it. Taylor, you didn't know what I was singing. Right? Listen, one person can get them here because he walks with us. He talks with us. And he tells us that we are his own. But the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Y'all got to know this. Y'all got to have this relationship that many of us are talking about so that if you have it and you have it and you have it and you have it and you have it, then it's a corporate thing when we get here. It's an individual thing when I'm at my house. But when we get here, I need to have it more than just it be an individual thing. It needs to be a corporate thing. That's why when MCs or expediters get up here and say, if you don't help me praise God, I'll praise God all by myself. No, you won't. Not here. That's not why we came here. You didn't come here to praise God all by yourself. You can praise God better all by yourself at home. No, we all came here to praise God. I don't want to come here and praise God by myself because y'all make it difficult for me to praise God. what we got to drag through to get into the presence of God? Chanel just winked her eyes at me because she's a worship leader, so she understands. The truth is, I'm going to let y'all go because this is too heavy. Uh, but if all of us corporately can keep God in the room, I promise you, We'll see God do things we've never seen him do before. If all of us do our part, and it's not an individual thing, God is no longer just coming to kingdom just because Bishop asked him to. This church ain't about an individual. This church is about us. Somebody say us. This church ain't about him. Everybody say this church ain't about him. Say, this church is about us. We have a glory cloud forming. And we got to keep it here. We need to keep God here. An individual can invite them. But the group of us got to make them stay. Don't leave God. I know we haven't dotted every I and crossed every T. But give us another opportunity. Help us to stay in your presence. We don't want to just get in the presence of God and get out of the presence of God. But we want to stay in his presence. We want to live in the presence of God. What I learned through this text is that the fire represents the approval or the presence of God. If God is not approved, if he doesn't approve of what's on the altar, he's never showing up. But when Solomon made an end of praying, God's approval showed up. And his approval, his presence, his appreciation consumed what was on the altar. And it created such a glory that the priest could not even stand. There's a glory. I want you to hear me. God told me something this week. There's a glory coming to this house that's going to be so weighty that we won't be able to stand up under it. 
it's going to be so weighty that the people that come in the temple can't even stand up under this weight. God said there's a glory coming that's going to be so heavy that you won't even be able to stand up under it. This, this glory ain't even going to be about you. This glory ain't going to be about the pastor. This glory ain't going to be about his message, whether he can preach well or not. This glory ain't going to be about whether they can sing well or not. This glory is going to be about whether God is approving of our sacrifice. What is on the altar of our hearts? If we can get God to approve of what's on the altar of our hearts, then this weighty glory will stay with us. The Bible says the priest couldn't stand to minister. And then the people, not only the priests, the people joined in with the priests and said, For surely he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. It's not it, the, when God's presence hits the room, when the weighty glory of God hits a room, it's not just about the priest. It's going to hit everybody. And we ain't going to be able to stand up under it. To the point where we say, for his mercy endureth forever. The grace of God is the unmerited favor of God. It's something we don't deserve. But the mercy is this. God withholding something back from us that we do deserve. Sister Mary, the, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Has anybody, and you don't have to raise your hand, I'll raise my hand. Has anybody ever sinned before? Okay, so this is what the mercy of God does. We've sinned and we deserve death, but his mercy holds death back. This is, this is the glory of God for his mercy. That's why we say it. For his mercy endures forever. His mercy keeps holding death back. Death is coming because of our sin, but his mercy endures forever. His mercy is holding something back that we do deserve. That's the difference between grace and mercy. Grace gives us something that we don't deserve. Mercy withholds something from us that we do deserve. Kingdom, I'll say this. We can stand all over this building. I'm done. I'll say this. God said it to me, and I believe him with all of my heart. There's a glory that's getting ready to hit this house that's going to be so weighty, it's going to be so heavy that we're not going to be able to stand up under it. We're not going to be able to stand up under the weight of his glory. That's what this text is showing us. This text is showing us that God showed up and when he showed up, the priest couldn't stand the minister. Because the glory of God filled the temple. We got to look at this text and find certain things. What happened? We found out how they got God there when Solomon had made an end of praying. Fire came down and consumed what was on the altar. So prayer gets God into the place. What's on the altar? gets God in the place. It was comical, but it was revelatory. King Solomon had 22,000 bulls coming down Columbia Road for at least five days. And he was offering them. Do you know what that means as a sacrificial offering? I, I, I didn't say it to you, but he was killing those bulls. 
They were killing those bulls on the altar. Blood, guts, all of it was on the altar for five days at least. 22,000 bulls, a hundred and he said, this ain't enough for God. God is too good for us to stop at 22,000 bulls. 120,000 sheep after the bulls sacrifice on the altar. Do you know what that sacrifice is? I can only imagine as they're dragging the bulls, as they're dragging the sheep, the sheep are trying to run away and they're dragging them back to the altar and sacrificing them unto God. See, when we read the Bible, we got to read the Bible. Some of us are coming to this altar. We're coming, we're coming crying, screaming, pulling, but we're going to come. You don't want to leave it alone, but I prophesy over your life. You're going to leave it alone, and you're going to come to this altar as a sacrifice. You're going to come crying, screaming, bucking, but you're coming. You're coming to this altar. And as you give yourself as an offering to God, there's a weighty glory that we won't be able to stand up under. It's one thing to invite them here. It's another thing to keep them here. And he's going to stay based on his approval of our sacrifice. Ask somebody what's on the altar. I hear God so clear right now. I promise you I hear God more clear than I've heard him in a long time. God said there's a glory that's coming. And no matter what is going on in your life, there is a glory that is coming. And we're going to see the manifestation of what God does because of who he is. He can't show up and be something without doing what he does he's gonna show up and be it he's going to be the healer he's going to be the way maker he's going to be a burden bearer he's going to be who he is once we get him here with the sacrifice that's on our heart one person can get them here, but we all corporately got to keep them here. What is your sacrifice that you placed on the altar? Somebody say the glory is coming. Oh, I hear the Holy Ghost. Somebody say the glory is coming. Come on, 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 say it like you mean it. Say the glory is coming. The glory is coming. The glory is coming. The glory is coming. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The glory is coming. The glory is coming. The of me and more of you is what I need. I want your glory. Hallelujah. Less of me. Less of me and more of you is what I need. Sing, I need your glory.
cloud is forming. The glory is coming. Hallelujah. What a message. <laughs> what a message. Hallelujah. The glory is coming. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the glory of God that is to come. Let us get our houses in order and preparation for what the Lord is releasing into our possession. Hallelujah. God has greater in store for us kingdom. Hallelujah. Greater is at the precipice. It's on the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Give God glory, honor, and praise for this message this morning. Hallelujah. We give God praise for his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give God praise for his word today. Hallelujah. And we thank God for the messenger this morning in the form of our pastor, Bishop Robert C. Perry II. Hallelujah. If you would like to sow a seed into this word today, if you haven't had an opportunity to give, you may give at this time. We can't pay the man of God for the word, but we can sow a seed to say thank you, Jesus, for this word. Sow a seed into this word. Hallelujah. If everybody had an opportunity to give, we're going to go home together. But before we go, we want to ask, is there anyone who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior? If there is one who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we would like to invite you into a relationship with him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we give God praise. We give God glory, honor today for his word. We honor him today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The glory is coming. The glory is coming, kingdom. Hallelujah. And we are going home together, standing all over this room. If you're able, please stand as we are departing together. Turn to your neighbor and say, I pray that God would cover you, God would keep you, and he would mightily bless you until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, kingdom. <laughs>